Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast to the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Theological Library and a former dean up there in Wheaton at the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Our purpose in these podcasts is really very simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. Joining us today on Exegetically Speaking is Dr. Douglas Moo, who is the Wesner Professor of Biblical Studies here at Wheaton College. Doug, good to see you. Good to see you too, David. Yeah, great to be in your presence rather than by (laughs) Zoom. So much of education has sort of been dummy down, I think, by putting it on Zoom. But it's great to be together here on Wheaton's College campus. Yeah, good to have you here again. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Now, you're working on Hebrews, a commentary on Hebrews for the Zondervan Exegetical Series, and we're going to talk about Hebrews today. Chapter 2, Hebrews 2, verses 6 through 9. Set up for us what we're looking at, what we'll be talking about today. Sure. This is a fascinating text where our author turns to the humanity of Jesus having established Jesus' deity in chapter 1. And he integrates Psalm 8 into his argument, and that's where we're going to focus our attention today. How does he integrate Psalm 8? How is he using the language of that psalm? Hmm. And the decision about that is complicated both by some exegetical matters, but also by the difficulty of translation into English, which kind of puts a layer of confusion into the whole thing. And that's why learning the biblical languages helps a bit. That's exactly right. I would dare to say that this is one of the many texts in Scripture where there is no really good English translation. That You have to make some choices one way or another, and whatever choice you make, mm-hmm. you run the risk of obscuring some truth that you find in another choice. Yeah. Now, now, when our writer is quoting here, is he quoting the Septuagint, the Greek version, or is it more sort of in tune with the Hebrew version? The author of the Hebrews is famous for relying almost exclusively on the Greek. Very, very few places does he deviate from the Greek, and when he does, it's not clear that he's using Hebrew. So most scholars are convinced that the author is not using the Hebrew text at all. And Psalm 8 figures fairly prominently in the New Testament. Yeah, it does. Uh, This is not the only place that's language gets picked up, although this is the only place it's quoted to this kind of length. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's kind of delve into that then. It has been somewhere, <laughs> uh, I love that, somewhere somebody said, uh, somewhere it's been testified, right, or it's been, uh, witness has been born to it. That's sort of the, the opening gambit yes, there, right? Yes, right. And then he quotes the passage, so, so take us through that. Sure. And here again, you have to kind of choose the translation you're going to start with. I'm actually going to start with the ESV. Okay. So this is what the ESV has. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. And then we need to hear the application as well. Our author begins at the second part of verse 8. And putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Now, what's challenging here is that the ESV is is following, as it usually does, pretty closely the syntax of the Greek. So in the Greek here, the word man in verse uh, 6 is singular. The pronouns that follow up from that are all singular, him, 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 throughout here. Mm -hmm. So they're reflecting in that sense uh, accurately what the Greek has in the syntax. The challenge here, though, is this. If you go back to Psalm 8 and uh, look at what's actually going on there, and of course, anytime we're dealing with an Old Testament text in the New, one of the first things we want to do is go back to that Old Testament text, look at the context, and see what's going on there. Right, exactly. Psalm 8 is obviously a psalm celebrating humanity's role in the created world. It picks up language from Genesis 1, uh, image of God, and so forth. So it's celebrating human beings generally. And that's why, for instance, uh, the NIV translates Psalm 8 like this. What is mankind you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? And then follows up with plural pronouns to make clear to the average English reader, no, this is not a passage about a single man. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is not a single person here. No, this is a passage about human beings 
generally. But that complicates things when we begin looking <laughs> at the application you see in Hebrews 2. Because it becomes singular, doesn't it? It becomes singular there in the ESV. Now, in the NIV of Hebrews 2, we keep the plurals. So if you look at the NIV, it translates uh, much like the Old Testament is translated here. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? And so forth. A son of man that you care for him. You have made them a little lower than the angels. Put everything under their feet. So you have the, the attempt here to you know, capture in modern English what's really going on with the, the language here, and you can go different directions in that. Mm-hmm. The problem, though, what is the author of the Hebrews doing with Psalm 8? <laughs> exactly. Particularly that, <laughs> that, that phrase, son of man, you right, see. Right. Now, of course, in the OT, as I think most of us know, man and son of man are simply parallel ways of saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. So it's clear in the Hebrew text, clear in the OT, that son of man is just another way of talking about a human being. However, because son of man occurs so often in our New Testament as a description of Jesus, there can be a tendency then when we see son of man here to read Psalm 8 as if it's referring to Jesus throughout. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's the case then, our author is talking about how Jesus fulfills the role of Psalm 8 simply because he fulfills what that text was originally talking about. He is the man. He is the son of man. Hmm. So our author is bringing that kind of application into the situation here. So the divinity has been established in chapter 1. Now chapter 2 seems to say here Jesus is the ideal of what humanity has been about or should have been about from the very beginning. Yeah, that's exactly right. However, I think you're right in that way of reading what the author is doing here. But the problem is that singular translation can make that difficult to see. When you have all of these hymns, the Son of Man you care for him, made him a little lower, particularly in the application, putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we don't yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see Jesus. I'm shortening it a bit there. Mm-hmm. Now, if I were to read that, uh, I would think that the uh, hymn is probably Jesus throughout. And the contrast here is a contrast of time. At present, the author emphasizes, we don't Ah. see everything in subjection to him, Mm. implication, but we will one day when he is crowned with glory and honor. So an eschatological text in a way. That's exactly right. This kind of already not yet tension might be present here. Right Now, my problem with that is I don't think that's the right way to read this text. Oh, Okay. I think that the author is quoting Psalm 8 as it was originally intended, that is, to refer to human beings in a general way. So when he draws his conclusion then, and let me read the NIV here now, in putting everything under them, human beings, Hmm. you see, in a general way, God left nothing that is not subject to them. At present, we don't see everything subject to them, in other words, God gave humanity back in the garden, Genesis 1, Mm -hmm. this task to subdue and have dominion over the created world, Mm -hmm. to have everything in subjection to them. And our author, picking up the language of Psalm 8, makes the claim, fairly obvious, that we don't see everything in subjection to humans. A lot of things are outside our control. Mm -hmm. However, what we do see, our author says, is Jesus. And that's where I think the transition comes. And that is in verse 9. That's right. We do not see everything in subjection to human beings, to them, Ah. end of verse Mm 8, but we do see Jesus. And Jesus here in the Greek comes at the end of this clause, Mm -hmm. which is typical in Hebrews for emphasis, almost like the author holds it back. So I think what our author is doing here is saying, you know, humanity was given this particular mandate from God. They were designed to be these kinds of people who would rule over the created world. Human beings, in a sense, have failed to this point, at least, in that mandate. But there is one man, a representative human, Mm. Jesus, who fulfills the role of Psalm 8, is the true human being, the human being, qua human being, as it were. Mm. And it is in him that we find, therefore, the destiny of humankind coming to its fulfillment. Mm. So I think that makes a lot more sense of the reading, but again, it can be obscured if we don't translate the right way. Right, and and these pronouns, it seems like so much is riding on these pronouns, right? It does quite a lot. Getting the pronouns right at that point. 
That's exactly right. So you work with the NIV committee. Were you instrumental in helping them see this at some point to help translate that correctly? I, I don't know what it, the NIV, the, the first rendition was. It, we had spirited debates on this text, very spirited yeah. debates, because there were several of us on the committee who had different views. And again, if you look at scholarship in general, it's fairly evenly divided on these views of mm-hmm. what's going on here mm-hmm. in Hebrews 2. And that was mm-hmm. reflected on the committee as well. So we eventually took a vote. Yeah, I guess you could kind of say my view won. Uh, <laughs> but we put the other view in a footnote. And ah. this is something we often do when we think it's a close call mm-hmm. uh, in terms of what's going on in the exegesis. We want the English reader, yeah, okay, here's the option we've chosen in the text. But we want you to see the other option here because it's a really good alternative, and mm-hmm. we don't want you to miss that. Now, I don't know how many people ever read those footnotes, but well, at least we stick them in there. I, th- I think a number of people do because <laughs> I've had people ask me about for those footnotes yeah, sometimes yeah. and what they mean. So I think that's very useful. That's a very interesting reading of this text, Doug. I appreciate you mm. being with us today sure. on Exegetically Speaking. It's been fun. Thanks to Ian Rosine, Rebecca Larson, and Silvio Vasquez, who help us produce this podcast. Thanks as well to John Lonsma, our Wheaton-based director, who makes this podcast possible. We're grateful to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, then you need to consider Wheaton College. Whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, we have amazing programs, our first-rate faculty, and some of the best students in the world. So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for Modern and Classical Languages. Get started today. If you have questions about this or any of our podcasts, we'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions or questions about any passage in the Hebrew Bible or Greek New Testament, send us an email and we'll see if we can get one of our experts to weigh in on that for you. Our email is exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening.